This panel is on uh, the uh, changing nature of warfare. Um, and while uh, neither of the two reports that are the basis for this conference, I suppose, directly addresses that question, uh, there is lots in both reports, nevertheless, uh, from which we might draw inferences about the changing nature of warfare. And so that's what we're going to discuss for the next hour. Uh, the first thing I should tell you is who I am. Uh, I am. I am neither George Lund nor Chris Williams, uh, both of whom, regrettably, uh, 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 have been uh, uh, unavoidably uh, not just detained but uh, distracted by important personal business that we learned about over the weekend. I am instead Steve Grundman. Uh, I am the, uh, I am the uh, M.A. and George Lund Fellow for Emerging Defense Challenges here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, I've been a management consultant over the last dozen years before which I served in government in which capacity I uh, uh, first got to know our two panelists here uh, Michelle and Tom Enders, Michelle Flournoy and Tom Enders. Um, uh, let me say a little bit about our two guests. Um, I'll make a, a few framing remarks and then I'll turn to each of them for brief remarks to start uh, what I would expect to be an engaging conversation with all of you. Um, so Tom to my left, uh, Tom is the CEO of EADS. Again, neither, uh, both of our guests hardly uh, require an introduction, but I'll make a brief one. Uh, Tom, uh, as of earlier this year, is the CEO of EADS. Um, <clears throat> he has a, 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 you know, a long career, actually now dating around 20 years, uh, with EADS and its predecessor companies, uh, before which, however, um, he also had nearly a whole decade of work in and around government, both in uh, the German parliament, in the German Ministry of Defense, and even, God, in uh, think tanks. Um, uh, <laughs> of all, uh, all such things. So uh, we shouldn't give him too easy a time um, if he begs off on these hard political military questions uh, as, a, as businessmen sometimes tend to do because he's got that, that think tank lineage in him. Uh, Michelle uh, is a senior advisor right now to the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, we would all know her uh, uh, more commonly as the former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Um, and uh, also as one of the co-founders of the Center for New American Security. Um, so let me just make a few remarks. Uh, actually, the, remark, the remarks I'm going to make to frame the discussion uh, actually are bor borrowing from uh, the comments you might have heard uh, George Lund uh, offer. George is the uh, vice chairman of the Scowcroft Center. Uh, he is the patron of the fellowship that uh, I'm so pleased to hold. <clears throat> and uh, he's a private equity investor. He's a private equity investor. He's the chairman of uh, Torch Hill Investment Partners. And as he and I talked about uh, his preparation for participating on this panel, um, we talked about a, a frame in his mind that was uh, around how what he would call the business model of warfare changing. Um, and while there are several elements of that that I won't go through in detail, um, I will offer a couple of thoughts that I think were in his talking points. Um, so uh, the, the argument would be, that we have been uh, working through uh, a business model of warfare since the end of the Cold War, uh, a, an inflection point perhaps, uh, uh, I think the Nick might suggest, the, the last uh, major inflection point in uh, geopolitical affairs uh, beginning in 1989. That era had the convenience for the purpose of, of, uh, of recognizing a, a model of warfare, uh, had the convenience, uh, if I may put it that way, of, uh, of the Gulf War of 1991 uh, to serve as some kind of a template uh, for what the future of warfare uh, beyond the Cold War might have been. Um, and there are at least a couple of, of features of that uh, model uh, that, that I would bring into relief here, one of which was, uh, so coming off of the Gulf War, uh, the character of, of conflict was kinetic, uh, most, most, most notably. Um, and the particular comparative advantage that the Western armies, uh, or at least the, the Western-oriented armies, <clears throat> um, employed to great success in that campaign was precision, right? So people talk about uh, the, uh, the 1991 uh, Gulf War as having launched a precision revolution in warfare. And, um, uh, and we planned, not exclusively, but around that kind of a template uh, for about a, uh, a decade. This is when I served in the Pentagon, and, and I, I know M Michelle was in uh, the Undersecretary for Policy at that time as well. Then along came the Black Swan of, of September 2011. And the warfare that uh, we've been involved in over the last decade 
um, has not been without relevance to kinetics and precision revolution, uh, but there has been a lot of other uh, elements to uh, what's been successful and, and, both, and also lessons learned from those campaigns mm -hmm. uh, that I think now set us up at this inflection point to reconsider uh, that template, uh, maybe formed all of 20 years ago, and uh, try to figure out what the nature of warfare will be in this era. Perhaps it doesn't have a, a name yet, but beyond the post-Cold War era. If, if, if we accept that we are now at a new inflection point, I would characterize the one preceding as the post-Cold War era. Um, and so the topic that, that we are here to discuss, maybe not exclusively, but uh, centrally, is what will be the nature of, uh, of warfare uh, going forward beyond this inflection point into this next era. So there is, there is lots of uh, impetus in, in these reports for this discussion. I'll just point out uh, a handful of them from, from the Nick report. Um, so among the megatrends, uh, certainly uh, I uh, note individual empowerment, uh, which was uh, no doubt uh, an important part of the preceding panel's discussion, uh, but also what, what I think the report calls the food, energy, water uh, nexus. Um, uh, a little bit of uh, the familiar competition for resources, but some of those resources may be having a different flavor uh, than we've known in the post-Cold War era. Um, among the game changers, the rapid change of, of power um, strikes me as having particular relevance to the nature of warfare um, and also the, uh, the advent of, of new technologies I, uh, is almost the most obvious uh, uh, impetus uh, in the Nick report uh, to a conversation about the changing nature of warfare. All four of the scenarios that, uh, that uh, the, Nick, the Nick calls out I think have some obvious implications for the changing nature of warfare. Um, I think the last of them, uh, I forget the, the, the name that's given to it, um, is particularly uh, uh, challenging, I suppose one might say. Uh, the, 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 the world in which uh, perhaps non-state actors uh, become more, more prominent players in even security uh, than, than state actors are today. I think that is among the four uh, scenarios that are depicted there, the one that perhaps challenges our, our preconceptions uh, or maybe simply our post-Cold War conceptions about the nature of warfare most especially. Okay, so with that, uh, by way of introduction, um, I, I, would, I would turn to our two panelists here, perhaps starting uh, right here with Tom, if I may. Thanks, Steve. <coughs> as, I, as I told you behind the, behind the scene, I'm still wondering why Fred put me on that panel listening to uh, General Cartwright yesterday and the uh, uh, technology discussion I was thinking that maybe I, I should have contributed to that, but I will try, I will try my best here. And uh, well, my, my academic times are more than 20 years back, so I'm, I'm really not uh, uh, drawing much on, on, on that here. Let me make a few remarks uh, on the general context before uh, I bring up a, a few ideas about changes in, in warfare. I would say, first of all, at least for the last 20 years, geostrategic pundits experts have uh, always failed to forecast future wars. Maybe the, the second Gulf War, the Iraq-Iraq invasion, was the one that was forecasted uh, uh, by most <coughs> because that was kind of unfinished uh, business. Um, you know, most of the experts, and I think we should be humble when we, when we look forward, this is why I'm saying that we can only identify the risks, we can identify certain areas that are uh, at risk or certain zones that are at risk. And uh, surprise has always accompanied every outbreak of, of conflict. Whether we look at uh, Libya, <coughs> the Balkan Wars starting in, 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 90, in 91, crisis in Africa, a completely unpredictable uh, continent, at least, uh, let's say, in the, in the middle, um, and so on. Secondly, as, as regards warfare, and you, you mentioned that already, the first Gulf War was probably the last war fought according <coughs> to established doctrines. At the time, it was the airland battle uh, concept or, or doctrine. And ever since then, adapting to the uh, political objectives, to terrain, to asymmetric forces, asymmetric threats, adversaries, new technologies in each of these conflicts, I think, has been, has been the rule. Uh, third, we know what techniques will be used in warfare from, from, <coughs> from now to 2030, at least largely. I think most of that stuff is in, 
invented already. What's interesting is to look at the, the framework of future military engagements. And that, I think, is large, largely or is probably be characterized by, by three uh, major factors. Number one, the expansion of battle space from air, land, sea to space and cyber, obviously. Number two, some sort of requirement for supranational legitimacy. And number three, commitment to working in, in coalitions uh, that are not preset, uh, you know, famous, famous term of coalitions of the willing. I think we'll see that also uh, very much in the future. Mm -hmm. Another feature, I think, will be the multiplication of actors seeking to play a role in um, political solutions in, in conflicts, states, but also NGOs, sub-regional organizations, uh, maybe even, probably even private, private companies. And given this, the ability to, to achieve a high degree of uh, interoperability and, and coordination amongst different actors, and again, not all state <laughs> actors, uh, will be of paramount importance. Fourth, wars start in unexpected way and, uh, and for reasons usually poorly anticipated. Future wars will be fought far from <coughs> national basis. Western public opinion will find it hard to, to justify them. And I think that's a major thing we, we need to take into our uh, calculation uh, going forward. Uh, our societies, our Western societies, are casualty adverse. Casualty adverse as far as the employment of our own troops, uh, putting soldiers into harm's way is concerned. Casualty adverse also when it comes to uh, avoid casualties in the wars with the, with the, the, adver the adversaries, so-called uh, uh, terrible word, uh, collateral, uh, collateral damage. Um, <coughs> and I think that will remain a feature. I, I, I do not anticipate, I'm not a an expert, I do not anticipate that that will change anytime soon in the next uh, 20, uh, 20, 30 uh, years. That means we will prefer to, to fight wars from standoff distances. We will we'll use, obviously, uh, drones and, and UAVs and all kinds of robotics. We're talking about robotics yesterday, found that a fascinating uh, discussion. Up to uh, Robotic uh, lawyers uh, were predicted, but <laughs> that was a different story. Found that particularly interesting, and obviously uh, precision and to avoid to get boots put boots really onto into the ground. I think NATO will suffer after the, the drawback from Afghanistan, lengthy period of uh, expeditionary fatigue, uh, and uh, that'll that'll show, um, and. You know, we've seen in Libya coalitions of the willing for future engage engagements <coughs> instead. I think that is, that is going to be with us. Um, fifth point, downsizing of Western forces. I think that is a, uh, you'd expect an industry man to say that, but uh, it's, a, it's a worrying trend. Uh, because forces are downsized. Look particularly at Europe. Uh, the, the downsizing is done now under the immediate uh, pressure of the financial crisis uh, and the, um, the fiscal crisis. Um, downsizing, you're losing, we're losing traditional capabilities and at the same time not building up the capabilities that we, that we need in the future. Come to that point in a minute. You know, that, that's around uh, cyber, cyber defense, cyber uh, offense. Um, if we look then for you know just just a few ideas for future warfare, I think it's pretty obvious to to everybody here in, in the room that uh, cyber uh, netics within forces and the adversaries make uh, cyberspace a a, a very um, important area. This is true in all kinds of of conflicts, if it's symmetrical or or asymmetrical. And cyber capabilities, we all know, include neutralizing weapons, disorganizing command and control, disorganizing logistics, and you know, psychological actions. Um, the point I'd, I'd like to, to draw attention to, again, <coughs> not, nothing, nothing uh, original, um, is, our, is our increasing vulnerability in advanced societies uh, to, to cyber attacks. And just flying over here, read a good article uh, uh, Joe Lieberman in the 
Herald Tribune was, was ringing the, the alarm bell. That was very much about you know, not, not being able to get the proper legislation uh, into force in, in, in this country here. Um, I think you, you, can, you can simplify it. Almost everything uh, nowadays contains a microchip. In the 70s and 80s, we were concerned about electromagnetic pulses. Uh, detonation of nuclear weapons high in the atmosphere that could do harm. Now that was one thing, but today our vulnerability to uh, cyber attacks is, is much, uh, is much uh, bigger because everything, almost everything, uh, is connected to the internet. And if it isn't connected to the internet today, it surely will be uh, tomorrow. So if there's a trend, <coughs> the vulnerability I think is, is uh, increasing. The vulnerability of the IT-based society and economy is a, is a fact, and I think it's, it's still largely uh, ignored. And that will increase dramatically, and that will also increase due to certain fashionable trends in our societies that make things worse, reduce cost, increase efficiency, make everything user-friendly, make everything interoperable, <coughs> standardized, and according with, with norms. And the fifth point, the rest you outsource. Um, so that's the kind of, kind of things that, that uh, make our vulnerability much worse. Now, one thing, I mean, we, we've, seen, we've seen cyber used in offense, particularly, obviously, against the Iranians. It seems the Iranians are now striking back and targeted banks over here and stuff like that. I'd warn very much to, to use cyber as an offensive weapon by the West, as long as we have these strong vulnerabilities, and as long as we have no real plan how to defend our societies. Today, there's a huge asymmetry. I mean, our society, I would, I would say, is far more vulnerable than, let's say, the Iranian <coughs> society against uh, cyber attacks. And to use these this weapons uh, without thinking about our own vulnerability, I think, is, 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 uh, is very, very dangerous. Well, basically, uh, got a couple of more points, uh, Steve, but I'd, I'd, leave it, I'd leave it here and we can elaborate on some of the things in discussion, I guess. Right. Thank you, Tom. I, I think you, you, you belie your self-deprecating uh, suggestion that, that this was the wrong panel for you. Thank you very <laughs> much. Michelle. Great. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to say thanks for the kind introduction, but you left off the most important qualification for being here, which is that I'm a new board member of the Atlantic Council. So <laughs> I know that Fred was, would be happy if I mentioned that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I, I assure you, we actually did not coordinate our comments, but you'll hear a lot of um, similarity and echoing uh, between us. Um, but since you covered a lot of the same ground, I'm going to be very brief. Um, let me just start by uh, pay adding my two cents to the context. I think the Nick report does a very good job of highlighting some of the key contextual factors that will help define the future of warf warfare. Um, things like an increasingly congested and contested global commons, you know, air, space, maritime, cyberspace uh, domains with particular emphasis as on cyber as a new domain of warfare. Uh, urbanization, which means that in, in, uh, in some cases uh, warfare will be among, in and around and among civilian populations. Um, the proliferation of a host of new technologies, um, everything from you know, various IT uh, technologies, the use of big data, robotics, automation, autonomy, <coughs> the rising uh, of uh, new powers like China and India and the fundamental changes to the balance of power, uh, particularly in Asia, um, alongside more increasingly empowered individuals. Um, so I think you know, all of that reminds us um, uh, of, of the context. I, I would add that uh, I agree that given uh, the United States and the Western military's conventional dominance, um, when we find adversaries in the future, when we encounter them in the future, we, can be, um, uh, we will certainly see them using asymmetric approaches to undermine our strengths and exploit our vulnerabilities. Um, in addition to what was laid out in the report, I would add that there are some imp impacts that the last decade of war has had on the U.S. in particular that are, is worth considering. First of all, I do think, um, particularly in the wake of the Iraq War, um, increased public scrutiny and I would say skepticism about both the intelligence foundations of our uh, cases, if you will, and also causes belli. Um, that, that 
any, any um, path to war is going to be uh, even more closely scrutinized than in the past. I think it's fair to say that um, both in the U.S. and in Europe, there's a, f a pretty high degree of public fatigue um, uh, uh, based on the last uh, decade, and that will create a higher bar uh, for putting uh, boots on the ground. Um, I think there's also a more sober and perhaps chastened view of nation building. And you know whether we know how to do it, whether it's possible to do well, uh, the costs of doing so, and, and so forth. Um, and of course, we see a number of resource constraints in the current and climate of budgetary austerity, which will likely last for a while, mm -hmm. that will also, I think, reduce public support for prolonged campaigns. The, all that said, I think it, we have to be very careful not to fall into the sort of post-Vietnam type of thinking of, well, we'll just never do that again. Because as um, Tom said, we, we don't get to choose. We're horrible at predicting where we go to warfare, uh, where, where we go to war. And uh, we're, we don't always get to choose where we fight. Um, so that should, that should give us all pause for assuming away um, some of the, the uh, scenarios that we might want to. So given all that context, um, I think Frankly, the Department of Defense, and you know, I'm biased since I, one of my, my last acts was helping to put together the strategic guidance that's currently in place, but I do think that calls for a military that is extremely agile and flexible and full spectrum. Um, but again, I think we're very unlikely to find ourselves fighting a conventional adversary um, head on. Rather, I think what we will face is um, highly asymmetric forms of warfare at both ends of the spectrum, both um, at the high end in terms of technologically advanced rising powers um, using t uh, technology to try to uh, prevent our access, deny, <coughs> deny our ability to operate freely, and also at the very low end, um, the use of thing, techniques or approaches like you know, uh, uh, IEDs, suicide bombers, uh, terrorism and so forth. Now, the challenge is that, you know, in terms of thinking about the implications for our force structure, for our capabilities investment, for our, our operational concept development, our training, that's going to pull our forces in two very different directions to be able to deal with both the high end asymmetric warfare and warfare at the very, at the low end of asymmetry. Um, so let me take each of these in turn. I think at the low end, um, this means that the U.S. will continue to focus on working by, with, and through um, part, key partners, particularly in dealing with uh, things like terrorism and insurgency in the future, um, uh, pre preferring approaches where we have a relatively light footprint, but we're enabling and building the capacity of indigenous forces. That's going to put a particular um, emphasis on uh, our alliances, on building partnerships, on building the capacity of those partners both to assert their own sovereignty and, um, and protect their interests, but also be able to contribute to collective action towards common interests. At the high end, I think that you will see, again, uh, uh, you know, technology, high technology-enabled approaches to deny uh, access and area to the United States and its, its allies. And this will cross domains, maritime, space, cyber, and so forth. Um, those counters will be designed to impede or inhibit our freedom of action. Um, and uh, I think it will mean that we have to think long and hard about new operational concepts for um, dealing with that, and here, you know, things like what the Air Force and Navy are doing on air-sea battle is very important. Um, it means um, investing in technologies and capabilities that give us greater resilience. Um, and uh, it, it also means potential changes to how we train and fight. I was very interested, had a chance to talk with some folks in the Air Force recently and they were talking about how they've reintroduced in their training um, the scenarios in which you basically take away GPS, take away comms, take away all of the things that were so, you know, all of this whole gener last two generations of pilots have been trained to just expect and take for granted. And basically take all of that away and, and say you're operating now in a very contested and denied environment 
what are you going to do? And you have to rebuild skill sets. You know, the sort of, you know, the, the, and, you know if you think the, 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 pen, the pen and pencil, kind of pad and pencil kind of skill sets that um, we used to have. So that it, that's going to require a lot of us. It also means resilience in the sense of thinking about backups to the systems when they go down. You know, the space strategy that was put together recently talks a lot about um, relying more on commercial, more on international capabilities, <coughs> and a diversified framework in case we lose <coughs> key critical space capabilities in warfare. Um, so um, the, one of the things I would like to footstomp is the, um, the likelihood that cyber will be a major tool um, in, in the future. Um, obviously, many different approaches and functions here, um, everything from intelligence gathering, uh, information operations to shape uh, the battlefield and the environment, um, all the way up to isolated offensive strikes to uh, use of cyber as an assist or as an enabler to broader, uh, a broader conventional campaign. Um, I would agree <coughs> that um, this uh, certainly poses some very significant policy issues that we have only begun to think through. We, we really lack a conceptual frame. I like to think that we're in a period analogous to uh, you know, the early nuclear period before uh, Herman Kahn and Tom, Tom Schelling, you know, when we didn't have a conceptual frame for even thinking about this properly. Um, I do think that the, the, the growing importance of cyber will mean a number of things. Obviously, the ability to evolve our tools very, very rapidly, given how quickly, how dynamic the offense-defense interaction is and how fast the tools change. But more importantly, the importance of investing in the human capital really developing cadres of people who can uh, operate effectively in this domain. And then training, even uh, beyond this, the cyber cadre, training uh, our war planners in the integration of cyber. How, how do you even think about cyber when you're planning and conducting a broader uh, campaign? Um, the last point I just want to highlight is that in so many cases, I think, in future warfare, it will challenge our framework, which we tend to think of warfare as geographically rooted. And so we have the COCOM <coughs> construct where you have a, a, um, a supported COCOM who's got the geographical responsibility and then supporting people, other people supporting him. But when you, whether you think about warfare in which there are also cyber attacks going on on the United States or on Europe at home, or whether you think about a loose nuke situation where you have a country, of, you know, a region of origin, a transit region, and some other region that's the target. There are many, most of the scenarios that I think are plausible in the future will challenge our traditional concepts and ways of organizing ourselves and cause us to have to think about how do we conduct uh, operations on a global basis with um, a, a very dynamic relationship changes in time where in one, you know, in some areas someone is, uh, one COCOM is supported and the other, the next moment another one is being the supported. So I think a lot of um, that will challenge how we, we organize ourselves. So bottom line, um, lots of change uh, anticipated, big implications in terms of the capabilities we're protecting and investing in the force structure that we choose to shape, um, it, concept development, really thinking about new approaches, um, training, and the development of our human capital. Thank you very much. So while all of you are queuing up your questions, I, I wanted to pose one um, that is, <coughs> is just slightly, uh, admittedly off topic, but uh, for which the two of you, I think, uh, offer a, a unique perspective. And it springs from what I thought was one of the most compelling comments of yesterday's conference, and that is that in a period of rapid change, foresight and long-term planning is a higher imperative. There's a little irony there, which I, I find quite compelling. I, I think I heard this in the last panel yesterday. Um, and, and so therefore, you know, uh, rather than uh, the headline of this, of this Nick report being uh, where, wherefore uh, the U.S., I, I might have preferred uh, headlines, although uh, as unlikely as this is, to be planning really matters. Planning now matters, right? Okay, so 
each of you, uh, one in the corporate world, uh, the other in the Department of Defense, um, has, has a firsthand uh, and leading uh, role in uh, complex organizations planning. And I just wonder if I could interrupt the flow of our uh, attention to the nature of warfare just to draw that out. I'm interested in how these big complex organizations that each of you uh, has been a leader in actually attends to the planning and the foresight issue yourselves. Could you? Sure. Well, look, I'm, I work in an industry where you have uh, aerospace, you have product cycles of, of 20 and more years. <coughs> so inevitably, you have to think a little bit uh, uh, longer term, uh, particularly when you invest into, into technology. As I said, look, in, in technologies that we invest today, or we have invested today, we know them are the ones that uh, hopefully come into fruition in, in 20 years from now. That will be part of that, that, that scenario. Uh, so we have to do this long-term thinking. I mean, operationally, that doesn't mean we, we, we're throwing up plans for, for, for 20 years. Uh, the best we can do is to, to look forward for, for five years. But we regularly run, you know, scenario exercises where we try to capture, uh, like here, the major, the major trends, not going out to, to, to 2030, but 2020, 2025, et cetera, because that's important for where we invest our scarce resources. Uh, and in many companies, is it, is it, uh, is the focus has to be on commercial. And, and <coughs> less and less, even in, in aerospace and defense companies, uh, on defense. Um, by the way, that brings us into a nice conflict with uh, the investor community. Uh, companies like ours who have to, to look uh, a little bit over the horizon, or at least towards the horizon, 10 years out, 20 years out, um, have a conflict in the, with the investor community in the sense that investors, long-term, so-called long-term investors usually look out three years, uh, five years. Yeah, these are very long-term investors. Uh, so uh, to meet their expectations when you do your long-term uh, planning or to, to get a certain match here in coordination is, is, uh, is not an easy thing, I believe. I think there may be an analog between that tension and the tension the Department of Defense experiences with Congress, if I may dare say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please, Michelle. So, you know, DOD has um, some very defined approaches for doing long-term force planning, so projecting yourselves 20 years, at 30 years out, assuming that you'll have certain technology and capabilities, looking at, um, you know, using a scenario-based approach to, approach to looking at, um, uh, that and and drawing conclusions about investment strategies and so forth. But um, you know, forgive me to anybody who's deeply involved in that process. But I have always found it less than satisfying. Um, it's fairly stale and mechanistic. Um, and I think you know, for my what I what I think we really need is a much greater emphasis on the development of new operational concepts and a true willingness to experiment. Now. Given the focus of the last decade and the overwhelming uh, emphasis and energy that's been put into two real wars that we were fighting, obviously a huge amount of innovation at that uh, low end of the spectrum in terms of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. <coughs> we've learned a lot. We've incorporated a lot. We've innovated a lot. But in terms of the high end, um, I think that we're, we're just beginning down that road again with the um, air-sea battle work. Um, and I think we, we have to overcome some cultural impediments inside the military. The military, um, U.S. military anyway, has a certain um, intolerance of failure. There's, it's a very, there's a sort of zero defects culture. And anybody in industry or um, <coughs> outside knows that if you're really going to do useful experimentation and innovation, you have to be willing to fail. And so creating an environment and the incentive structure um, to allow people to really experiment uh, with uh, conceptually and with um, new ways of doing business um, is important. And, I, and again, I was heartened to find out that I think there's some beginning to be some creating of safe space for that. I think some of this Air Force training that's going on, the whole thing is designed to make people fail. It's designed to make you fail if you try to do things the way that you've been taught to do things. So you have to innovate. You have to try a different way. 
um, given the challenges they're throwing at you. So that, that's a hopeful sign. But I, I think we need to more consciously ensure that we're incentivizing that more broadly to be able to ensure that we adapt appropriately for the future. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to roll the questions up from the back, starting right there on the aisle. We have about 20 minutes to, to take questions and engage them. Please stand up. Uh, please do identify yourself. Yeah, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. I want to get into the question of how we're planning, particularly the United States and the West, are planning to finance future conflict. The last two we've borrowed uh, for. And when I think back to Suez, Eisenhower brought a halt to two bankrupt empires trying one more fling at this by turning off the money. And I think in terms of if we get involved by our security commitments uh, to Japan in some sort of conflict with China, is China really going to loan us money to carry out this endeavor? In other words, where is the money going to come from to fight these future wars? Okay, indeed, if I, if I may even slightly broaden uh, that, that challenging question. Um, we obviously are uh, crossing this threshold in, in an age of austerity. Um, and so uh, while it would be great to have the degrees of redundancy and complex varieties in our force structure and other things, we're probably going to have to trade some things off, which I'll just pile on to the question, uh, the general question about how we're going to finance this, if you will, transformation or recapitalization of uh, the defense establishment, either in the U.S. or, or in Europe. Uh, Michelle, you want to well, start? My hope is that one of the lessons we've learned the last decade is that we should we should be financing our wars as we go. <laughs> that we should not be um, reducing not you know reducing taxes as we engage in a decade of prolonged warfare, um, given the you know the <coughs> economic impacts that's had for us. Um, that said, I, you know we we are in a much more as you say interdependent world. Um, uh, where our uh, ability to borrow, our ability to raise funds is, how, is in, in, you know, obviously dependent on a broader global uh, financial system and so forth. The only thing I would say is that, you know, it is, um, there are, there, there, the interdependencies are strong, so strong that it, uh, there would be very uh, difficult consequences for China to try to break that interdependency in any kind of, um, uh, you know, decisive uh, manner. Um, and so, you know, the particular scenario you have has real implications, uh, that you laid out has real implications for China as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in terms of financing the transformation, I, I do think this is an area that um, needs to be a priority. It means that we <clears throat> have to, even as we tighten our belts in some areas, really protect <coughs> our investment in science and technology, research development, <coughs> experimentation, operational concept development, some of the newer capabilities that will really define the cutting edge um, of our future, and that we need to take cost out elsewhere. Um, my own view is that rather tr than trying to solve um, the austerity challenge on the back of the force in terms of modernization and force structure and readiness, we should be looking at parts of the department where we know there's excess investment that has been politically difficult to get at, but we really responsibly, we need to get at it, whether it's in excess infrastructure, whether it's in excess overhead, um, whether it's in um, the way we deliver healthcare, which I would argue if we took some lessons from the private sector, you could keep or improve quality and reduce costs. So there's just a lot of money to be gotten there before we restrict our investment in the future. Did you want to add in there, Tom? Sure. I would say the uh, absolute prerequisite to be able to finance to uh, the necessary investments in the future is to uh, we reduce our, our debt. Mm -hmm. um, this is not necessarily, this is not at all in contradiction to, to what you say, but we can't go on like that, to accumulate mm -hmm. debt on debt, be it in the U.S., be it uh, be it in Europe. Well, in the U.S., you still have a luxury where you can loan money uh, for, for, for a pretty uh, acceptable interest rate, not so, not so in Europe. Um, because if we go on like that, we also produce the next bubble, and that will disrupt our uh, financial and societal system uh, even more. Being European, I foresee that this for Europe, at least, uh, there's, a, there's probably a decade ahead of uh, consolidating 
consolidating budgets, going back to, 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 to balance budgets, reducing cost, hopefully also uh, uh, generating uh, new growth. But I think this is, uh, this is a very difficult decade ahead. And I see that, that the defense budgets, who were never very impressive in Europe in the first place, are coming down even further. And you see, you see governments, let's take the British government, Prime Minister Cameron, who I, who I think is really a great leader, but, but you know, they're trying to design an austerity strategy or policy where they, they safeguard not defense, mm. they safeguard social security because the electorate is particularly sensitive to that. So if you, if you put a fence around that, uh, you have to reduce uh, expenditures on defense, on transport infrastructure even more. That's a very worrying, that's a worrying sign. So if you look into this decade or try to anticipate what's, what's, what's going to happen, I think, um, ironically, European governments might be, might be even more rather than less reliant on, on US power projection and uh, and, and U.S. forces even to deal with fringe conflicts and wars around the Mediterranean. We've seen a Libya conflict where the U.S. was leading from behind and, and uh, France and, and Britain were doing, were doing their best. Germany opted out immediately. Um, that, uh, that's a very difficult proposition for the armed forces. By the way, high-ranking German Air Force official told me later, thank God our politicians didn't get us into that because I, I, was, I was afraid we got embarrassed uh, a week or two into the, to a conflict because logistically and ammunition-wise we wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to, to fight any longer. So this is how thin the military capability uh, is. And, um, uh, you know, you can maybe, maybe things brighten up and uh, we'll, we'll see uh, more rapidly growth in, in Europe. I don't see it. I think we have a very difficult uh, decade ahead, particularly for the defense posture and the investment into defense and security more broadly. As I said before, we see declining traditional capabilities and no investments or not enough investments into the new capabilities that we need. All right, I'm going to pivot to the front of the room uh, and ask Barry Pavel uh, to offer a question. Uh, with a microphone, please. Th thanks to both panelists. I thought it was a very, very strong um, um, rendition of what the future of warfare is like. But so when I went through Matt Burroughs' report um, and tried to sort of glean the defense agenda from there, I, s I saw a pretty scary world that included more uh, higher chance of interstate conflict, um, more nuclear weapon states. I saw sort of a story of proliferation of a lot of capabilities, not just to states, but to some new actors that act on um, sort of that are smaller scale actors that none nonetheless can act on a strategic, a strategic scale. And I think the report repeatedly identified three sort of main areas that were a concern in this regard, uh, often parenthetically, but they repeated it. And they said um, precision strike, used by individuals, cyber, which I think is well covered and we're investing a lot in there. We're not where we need to be, certainly, but uh, there's a lot of attention on it now. But the third area is the one I'm really the most worried about, and that is bio. And I wonder, if, is bio the next cyber? I mean, with all of the capabilities that the Nick report identified in areas regarding human augmentation, in areas regarding nanoscale use of medical devices, well, if you can, if you can make, pe make people better using nano, delivery, then you can certainly make people ill or kill them using nano delivery. So I wonder if warfare is not going to, if there's not going to be another, if we're sitting here in 10 or 15 years <coughs> and doing this conference, will we'll bio sort of at the scale of almost the molecular level, will that be the, the, the new domain that we're at least as worried about as, as we are about cyber now? And, and just sort of taking this whole picture together, I don't think our defense establishments are ready for this, for this world. And I, I think there's a, there's a good chance of strategic surprise in, in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. So I liked your emphasis on surprise and flexibility and ad adaptability. I'm really worried, though, about some of these new things that, that we're, no, we're nowhere near being prepared for. Do you want to uh, respond? Yeah, to I, I, would, I would just say I agree with you. And I think that um, we have only begun to scratch the surface in terms of even thinking about 
how this could be used in very discrete individual kind of ways for you know very uh, focused targeted you know whether uh, you know assassination or sort of terrorist type of uses or and let alone the sort of other end of the scale is how do you use this in a way that basically incapacitates an, an, you know, an entire force. Um, so um, I, I would agree with you, and I, I don't think we've given enough attention to thinking through the, both the applications of how we could use it as a, an instrument, but also how it might, more importantly, how, as importantly, how, much, how it might be used against us. Tom? Yes, I, I'm, I'm not denying that <coughs> this is a major challenge. On the other hand, uh, we've, we've, we've heard uh, warnings about bio for, for decades now. I remember that uh, in the 80s, the fear about uh, the use of bio, Soviet style, but then if it gets out of hand. Then uh, I was part of the exercise the end, end of the 80s, uh, around 1990, um, when I was in, in, in the government. The prediction was, oh my goodness, uh, the 1990s are the most dangerous uh, decade ahead for bio because that was the expectation, this is getting out of hand, Soviet Union is dissolving, you know, a lot of these uh, experts are on the loose. Um, didn't happen. Were we, just, were we just lucky? I don't know, I'm not enough of an expert, but I, I, I realize that with the, the nano developments in particular and the possibility to, de, to more refine and design uh, we're no longer talking about the crude bio, biochemical threats that uh, we had in mind uh, uh, in, in the past. I think it's a uh, fair and interesting question as to whether this next um, stage will realize the advent of some kind of a weapon with the revolutionary mm -hmm. significance strategically of nuclear, and it could be bio, uh, but I, I dare say that's an open question. Can I add one thing? One of the dangerous things in this if it is a transition period, is for cyber and for the new bio threat probably, that it's very hard, if not impossible, to identify the attacker. Mm. It's, in the olden days, whether it was nuclear or chemical, we, 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 we thought at least it was pretty clear who would have been the attacker. We would have been able to identify that, or where a missile is fired from, etc. Well, with cyber, you know, if you have a, a cyber attack from, let's say, a, far away Asian country, that doesn't necessarily mean these guys are sitting in this country. They may be sitting in your own country. They may be sitting in a neighboring uh, country. Um, so I think we need to work particularly hard. Also, if we want to establish down the road some sort of deterrence mm -hmm. in cyber mm -hmm. to identify the attacker, as long as you can't do this, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, far easier for, for any attacker to uh, to, to go ahead because he has a fair chance to get away with it. And that is the case today. That is the case today. Our companies, my company, is under constant attack. And so are many companies. The difference is just some realize, some don't. Um, uh, but it's, it's damn hard, uh, even for the best forensic experts, to tell, to find out where it is coming from precisely. They have some ideas, etc., cetera, but, but you know, nothing uh, definitive. Let me take Harlan Ullman's question, and then I'll sh pivot again to the back of the room. Microphone here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. I would like you both, if you would, to address what I think are two uh, serious and potentially fatal flaws in how America looks at war and military force. Uh, the first, in my judgment, has been our failure to have any kind of real cultural understanding goes back to Vietnam, but Iraq and Afghanistan really are key. So how do we get around having better cultural understanding? And this is more than just the intelligence question of uh, not having weapons of mass destruction. And second, we're getting killed in terms of cost exchange ratios. Let me give you a couple of uh, interesting figures. The United States is still sending bottled water to our forces in Afghanistan. It costs us $800 a gallon. Um, it costs us half a million dollars to field a soldier marine facing a Taliban that cost 50 whatever. Um, we spent in excess of 50 or 60 billion dollars, as Michelle knows, on counter IEDs. If you sum up how much money the Iraqis and the Afghans and Taliban have spent on IEDs, it's pennies. So we have a cost exchange ratio against us of five or 10,000 to one. How do we deal with both those issues, cultural misunderstanding and a cost exchange ratio, which is really perhaps causing us to spend our way into oblivion? 
Um, I'll take the first one on cultural understanding. I, I do, um, I think it is something that we're going to have to grapple with more effectively in the future. And in my view, it's first of all um, trying to ensure, particularly that our ground forces have, um, that evolve more in a direction like the special ops tradition in terms of having greater, at least regional awareness, if not cultural awareness of <coughs> in operating environments. Um, and I know the Army is at least considering how they might move more in this direction. But I also think it reminds us particularly um, uh, that, that the importance of, um, par of, of partnering with indigenous forces on the ground and working by, with, and through whenever possible. Because even if you have regionally oriented forces, you're never going to have someone who has the cultural understanding uh, of a native, um, someone who's from the country. And so figuring out how we plan and prepare to conduct warfare in a much more integrated way with um, indigenous partners is, is, I think, very important. On the cost exchange ratios, you're right. Um, I'm not sure how we, I mean, I think we obviously have to um, uh, look at this and look at their simpler, cheaper, easier ways to get some of our missions done, but I don't have an easy answer for you on that. Well, I was thinking, while you were talking, I was thinking, thinking history. The Romans had figured that out pretty well. Uh, they, <laughs> well, then they, uh, they had the same problem, basically, uh, cost exchange ratio, but uh, what they did was, uh, in lesser conflicts, they, they employed uh, auxiliaries. Uh, they didn't, they didn't uh, deploy the heavy uh, legions, uh, the well-armed, uh, well-trained, etc. Et so, but that gets us back to coalitions, not just coalitions between, between Western forces who are equally disadvantaged when it comes to your uh, cost uh, exchange, uh, but, uh, but, but, but to, to ours uh, who, who can employ forces maybe as effective against a asymmetrical opponent with a, a far, lesser, far lesser cost. Other than that, as an industry man, I can tell you these things cost a lot, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> you can. We have time for two more questions, and the first one I would ask from Byron Callen, if, if uh, you could give him a microphone, and then we'll come here for the last question. Philip. <clears throat> Do you have a microphone, please, for right there? Thanks, Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. Tom, I just wanted to talk about agility in your organization, in the ADS, and the benefits of being both a commercial company and a defense company. You think about a, a lean period for European defense spending. How do you maintain your defense capabilities in that kind of environment and remain competitive? I may be keying off Michelle's comments about agility and that importance. Hmm. That's, a very good, that's a very good question. Well, let's say that's the, uh, you have the advantage of, we have the advantage of uh, having both in our, our portfolio. And I'll give you one very practical ex example, Byron. I mean, uh, some, some years ago, we, uh, we seriously deployed the lean philosophy in our commercial sector. That was primarily Airbus. Um, I say seriously because we'd had, you know, lukewarm efforts before, time and again, that, that didn't amount to much. This time we did very, very seriously, very thoroughly, not just in production, but also in engineering, et cetera, and we're far from, far from perfect because we needed to do that because, uh, you know, we had to, we had to uh, improve our margins and we had to take cost out uh, significantly. Now, I've taken the champion of, uh, of, of that effort in, in Airbus, uh, s a Spanish, uh, a female colleague who had a lot of experience in automotive before. This is why we hired her in the first place. Uh, and to put her now in, on the defense side and say, you do the damn thing also on, on defense. Ooh, I mean, um, you find a lot of resistance, particularly defense people will say, you know, everything is completely different with us. You can't treat us like commercial people, et cetera, but that's bullshit. You, um, <laughs> you, you, you can do that. And, uh, but I think you really need a, a thorough lean philosophy. It takes years in industry to, to implement that. And people need to understand down to the shop floor that they are beneficiaries of that. Mm. 
but they're not big stems, but they are beneficiaries. So we started to do that really from the bottom up. We started by asking the blue collar, so what is it that bothers you <coughs> in your day-to-day -day work? Uh, what can we improve? What will make you happy? What make you faster, etc.? You start with that rather than imposing it from the top. You, you, you can really change the culture. But you need to, to stay course for, for years and, uh, and, and, and keep your credibility. And, and then uh, it, it spreads in the company. And people also understand that lean is the other side of a coin, or should be, of empowerment. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, only an empowered organization can be lean, because otherwise, you know, if you have a, an organization that micromanages, where you have bottlenecks, etc., it's impossible to do fast decision making and, and deploy your resources uh, faster. So it's a fascinating topic. I, I stop here, Byron. But uh, this is definitely an advantage if you have both worlds under one roof. You can exchange experiences and people. It's, it's the people who bring the experience. Finally, Philip. Microphone right here, please. Uh, thank you, Philip Stevens from the Financial Times. Um, I wonder if I could ask Michel Flournoy to, to, to address the, the, what it seems to me is the policy question, which hasn't come up in this, uh, in this session, which is um, how and when do governments use these new capabilities? Under what self-imposed, if you like, constraints? Uh, I suppose very briefly, are there any rules? I mean, if you're an outsider looking at the, the, the United States' use of drones, for example, you would draw, and I've certainly heard this in, in Turkey, you draw the conclusion that it's perfectly okay to use drones against terrorists based on other people's territory who are attacking you. <coughs> so the obvious case in Turkey would be the PKK. You also pick it up in India, you know, thinking that should those uh, people based in Pakistan who um, carry out attacks in, in the name of, sort of Kashmir against India. So in the case of what the US seems to have done is taken a sort of tactical decision to hit Al Qaeda um, which has opened a sort of new strategic Pandora's box, as it were. If you look at cyber, it's in sort of two, two channels, as it were. There's, there's cyber, which is espionage, a sort of extension, a sophisticated espionage. And then there's cyber that's offensive warfare. Again, the US vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran seems to have crossed the line and said, OK, it's, it's okay to use cyber in an offensive warfare um, uh, sense. So are we going to, are we entering a, a world in which these new forms of warfare are basically completely unregulated? So I think that it's a very important question, probably one of the most important policy questions we need to grapple with. Um, and I think in thinking it through, as a new approach or tool comes into being and is made available, I mean, I think you have to think hard about, um, you know, the interests that you're, uh, the importance of the interests at stake, the, uh, whether there are alternative means available, um, and to your point, the sort of demonstration effects likely. You know, where does, if you were to play this out many moves down the road, where does this take you in terms of, um, you know, uh, what, how do we need to think about U.S. vulnerabilities in the face of some of these, if others were to use these tools and so forth? You really have to develop um, not only a sort of operational concept, but also a broader sense of uh, strategy um, with regard to these things. So I do think that, um, you know, the, that this is, this is sort of a, a repeatable part of history. We tend to Get, get, in, get down a road before we fully start to digest and understand um, the, big, the big picture implications. And I think that for, certainly for, for cyber and, and a number of the other technologies that are noted in this report, um, we need to be doing more of that strategic long-term thinking up front. Um, and, I, and, I, and I do think that there are big both policy and ethical dilemmas associated with a number of these things um, downrange. So it's an important question. I don't have an easy answer for you, but it's an important set of questions for policymakers to grapple with. 
I'll dive into policy, Tom. I don't think you're nothing to it. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been an engaging hour. Um, I heard a couple things in particular that I, I, will, I will call out for what it's worth. Um, one is the breadth of the cyber dimension of the future of warfare. Uh, I guess maybe in caption I'll simply say it's, it's well beyond uh, digits, uh, you know, ones and zeros. There are policy issues, there are uh, actual uh, uh, engagement issues and others that I think sometimes um, escape the glib references to cyber warfare. The other thing um, I'll just observe off of the exchange between Byron and Tom uh, is that uh, it suddenly occurred to me, I, with my management consultant hat on, the world that's described here, rapid change, changing market shares of, of competitors and other things, sounds a lot like some very normal commercial markets. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps there is an, an maybe there's more to this analog, uh, at least maybe in, in terms of the way business uh, prepares and responds itself to rapid change and, and plans for and makes investments. Maybe there's more to that analog that ought to be pulled, a thread that, that could be pulled productively. Okay. Thank you to both of you. Uh, thank you also to EADS again for sponsoring the conference. Tom, thanks very much. Michelle, thanks.